In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit. My brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate this sacred mystery. You are sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners Christ of mercy. Christ of mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. Wait. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God, almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Enable us, we pray, Almighty God, to proclaim the power of the risen Lord, that we who have received the pledge of his gift may come to possess all he gives when it is fully revealed. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When the day of Pentecost had come, Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, that the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And Peter testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added to their number. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. The word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Truly the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, to deliver their souls from death and to keep them alive in famine. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Mary Magdalene stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. 
They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So yesterday, um, the reflection was about needing, in a sense, to um, earn the authority to speak. And earning one's authority to speak is a complex thing. And I always fear talking about it for the obvious fact that there's a high likelihood that I haven't earned it. And so this leads to a strange silence where you don't, the more, the more certain you are of the fact, then the less likely you're going to be the one to be the one touting it, or at least speaking about it with great regularity, because the more, the more you see the truth of it, the harder it is to put into words. Chesterton actually described this phenomenon um, in his description as to why it's so difficult sometimes to explain or to defend the faith, because of the fact that because it is so true, you can come at it from so many different angles so that it's hard to find a place to begin and it's hard to keep on track. And I know that feeling all too well. You know, when it's not just that you're convinced that something proves it, but that everything proves it. And learning how to narrow the focus becomes incredibly difficult. But narrow the focus we must do. And when we want to narrow the focus, it's not just in, in terms of an intellectual enterprise, but the thing that means the most to you. Because in the heart of that is the heart of the question of faith for you individually as a person and also for me. And you'll notice that in today's first reading, Peter is giving many proofs. Um, and it's important, um, I don't know if this is the word that's used here, but oftentimes the word that's used in Greek for proof is elenkos, which is a stumbling block. It's something that just kind of goes thud and, and hits you and gives you a feeling of instability less than a feeling of stability. So Peter is giving many, 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 many proofs. But the one proof that Luke, the writer of the Acts of the Apostles, is, seems to be most um, focused on is after, is Peter himself. <laughs> Peter, is sense, is the proof. And so after he has given his demonstration that Jesus is the Messiah, um, he points to the eyewitness and all of that. Then when after that proof and demonstration is given, then they say, well, what must we do? And he gives a simple answer. Um, he basically paraphrases the Old Testament, John the Baptist, and Christ himself. Repent. But what's important is not just that Peter is telling them to repent, but that he has done it himself. That he has already undergone this. In John's Gospel, it's not recorded in Luke, but in John's Gospel, Jesus specifically reinstates Peter after his threefold denial. And Peter weeps in both occasions, in the denial and in the reconciliation, because repentance hurts. It's painful. Because what you basically have to say is, I failed. Now, often we don't do that. And if you watch a petty argument among family or friends or coworkers, what usually happens is the mudslinging that happens is a direct result of the pain of repentance. So we don't want to do it. So this is what happens. You're in the office, you're in the workplace, and somebody says, you know, David made this mistake. 
And now my first response would probably be to point out how that person actually made the mistake and all manifesting my own fear of admitting the fact. And what usually happens in the long run when we create this tone of accusation is that nobody repents, nobody amends their behavior, and the cycle of stupidity just continues and continues and continues. Because to admit that you made a mistake, of course, well, <laughs> that's horrible. And so this leads then to a strange human phenomenon where we hate goodness more than we hate evil. I've discovered this to be a strange feeling. Um, and I can't go into details about the persons and places in which I learned this, but I have encountered more visceral hatred for good people attempting to do good than for people doing bad. You notice they didn't call them bad people. Anyway, um, we seem to resent failed saints more than we hate evildoers as such. You'll see this in the news too, right? When somebody does something plainly evil, and then people are like, the, the biggest scapegoating that happens is they always look at the, the situation that allowed that person to do something evil. And it's like, okay, yeah, that's a problem. But don't forget that the evil was done by that individual. And you'll notice um, the real good manipulators are always really good at sowing doubt about truth. This is one of the few things that Hollywood gets right. They don't get a lot, but they kind of get this. When you watch like a crime show or something like that, and the ur evil character is always able to worm his way inside the conscience of so many people and thereby undermine a society. You know, like, here's an, here's an example. When 9-11 happened, there were so many people that were saying, you know, well, America's the ones that are really to blame for this. And it's like, okay, granted. But you know who's really responsible? The guys who flew the planes. They were responsible. And then you have, like, these morally sanctimonious people saying, oh, well, you know, these people had no free will. They were just oppressed. It's like, no, they were jerks. And they made an evil decision. And they will be held accountable to that before the true God. That's what happened. And so repentance then gets a bad name because nobody wants to do it because we're surrounded by that kind of nonsense. Nobody wants to take responsibility and nobody wants to face the truth about themselves because they're always afraid of hostile judgment. And so Peter had to go through the hard and painful thing of admitting his fault before his Savior. And it's there that Peter discovered that God's ways are not our ways and God's thoughts are not our thoughts. That God doesn't bring up our faults in order to condemn us, but to set us free from them. Which explains then the double effect. Why, one, God always is trying to get us to repent, and two, why we're always so resistant to do it. And so why Peter is the proof is because he's not telling them to do something he hasn't done. And so many fake evangelists are rejected by the world for this one simple fact. They are telling the world to repent when they haven't done it. They refuse to admit it. And they'll say, it's like, oh yeah, you know, I used to live a certain way, but no, I'm good now. But that shows nothing's changed. Now they've just found a way of worming themselves in the good camp. And every apostle has to undergo this. And you'll notice that St. Paul has to go through the same thing. And St. Paul has a, in a sense, a much more difficult time of it 
Because he was clearer in his conscience. He was clearer in his pursuit of the truth. He was clearer in his righteousness. And it was that righteousness itself that got turned against itself and led him to what he would understand as evil. This is probably why a majority of our friends and family, when we talk about religion, or at least from their perspective, um, just kind of roll their eyes and turn a blind eye. They're like, yeah, you're telling me to repent of my licentious lifestyle or this, that, or the other thing. But what have you repented of? You're still spouting out that crazy nonsense that we grew up listening to you talk about. You're still talking like this, you're still acting like that. You're telling me to repent, but you haven't done a thing yourself. So if there's one thing that I'm going to suggest more and more as we go into the future, because very often when people are saying, well, how am I going to give witness to my family? Well, just do it by a good life, you know, by being an upstanding moral person. It's like, yeah, don't stop doing that, but do something even better. Have the courage to admit it when you screw up. Be able to go to your adult children or your, even your teenage grandchildren or your friends or your family members or something and to be able to say, I screwed up. No excuses, no explanations, I screwed up. And to do it with a smile. They might judge you. But God knows you. Do you fear their judgment or God's? Because God will reveal to you. You will have your own Sea of Tiberias moment when Jesus says to you, David, son of John, do you love me? David, son of John, do you love me? David, son of John, do you love me? And the only way that we can truly worship the true and living God is through that joyful self-abasement. Because unless we are able to see ourselves as small and unworthy before the true God, in spite of all your good works, you ain't worshiping him. Which is why that last line in today's gospel, which we heard on Easter Sunday morning, has such profound meaning. I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. It's not that God didn't love us throughout all the ages, but that we weren't worshipping him. We weren't praising him as he is, but as we wanted him to be. It's funny. How simple and straightforward the gospel is, and yet so profoundly true. It's almost as if it's been declared from the beginning of the world, and we, out of fear, refuse to hear it. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you. Fruit of the earth and work of human hands, it'll become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it'll become our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. Wash me, O Lord, from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sins. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. And may the Lord accept this sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Grant, we pray, O Lord, that we may always find delight in these paschal mysteries, so that the renewal constantly at work within us may be the cause of our unending joy 
Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, at all times to acclaim you, O Lord, but in this day, above all, to laud you yet more gloriously when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. For he is the true Lamb who takes away the sins of the world, and by dying he has destroyed our death, and by rising restored our life. Therefore overcome with paschal joy, every land, every people exults in your praise, and even the heavenly powers with the angelic hosts sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith, save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Therefore, Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, St. Peter, St. Paul, St. Mary Magdalene, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis our Pope and Gary our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. And to our departed brothers and sisters and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom, you continue, through, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, and graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and with your spirit. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Let us pray. Hear, O Lord, our prayers, that this most holy exchange with which you have redeemed us may bring your help in this present life and ensure for us eternal gladness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God, alleluia, alleluia. Regina Cheli, Amen. 